Well, welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Turn with me in your Bibles this evening to the book of the prophet Malachi, chapter 2, as we continue in this final book of our study through the minor prophets and the final, final book of the Old Testament. The theme of the book of Malachi is my messenger. And, and Malachi's name, that's exactly what his name means, my messenger, or it may be a, a shortened form of messenger of Yahweh. But Malachi brings a message from God to his people Israel. And, and as I mentioned, Malachi is the last of the Old Testament prophets. Uh, in fact, we won't have another prophet in your Bible for 400 years years until John the Baptist arrives on the scene. Now Malachi's ministry took place about 100 years after the return of Israel from their Babylonian captivity. And it was during the time or shortly after the time of Nehemiah. And, and we see that there were similar issues that both Nehemiah and Malachi had to deal with. First of all, the priesthood was defiled. We find that in Nehemiah 13, verse 29, and we find it in Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, through uh, chapter 2, verse 9, which we'll look at this evening. Number two, marriage was corrupt. That's Nehemiah 13, verses 23 through 25, and Malachi chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. And again, we'll look at that this evening. The tithe was being kept back. And we find that in Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 10 and 11, and Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. So very, very much a similar situations that both Nehemiah and Malachi had to deal with. So they were contemporaries. They lived and ministered at the same period of time. Uh, the key verse is Malachi chapter 1, verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord. Uh, isn't that great? The last book of the Old Testament and God reminds Israel, I have loved you. I've loved you. In fact, we read in chapter 1, the people responded, in what ways have you loved us? <laughs> and you can't hardly believe that they even asked the question. And God reminded them, you know, was not Jacob Esau's brother? And yet, Jacob... I have loved and Esau I hated, or I, some translations say I loved him less. Well, how did you love him less? Well, because I chose Jacob over you. Esau was God's was uh, Isaac's firstborn, and yet God chose Jacob, not Esau. And so, how if I loved you, I chose you. And you know, each and every one of us could could ask, ask that same question of God, and maybe you have at some point. God, do you even love me? Do you care about me? Do you know what's going on in my life, right? We could all be right there. And God would say, I chose you. I chose you. Out of this cesspool of humanity, I reached down and I chose you. I loved you. And, and, and in fact, the Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? Amen. God chose us, you see. He died for us. And so God has loved us as well. And we can take comfort in that. Now, last week in chapter 1, the Lord called out the priests because they were def offering defiled food on God's altar. They were offering the blind, the lame, and the sick. They didn't bring God their best. They brought what they didn't want. And then the priests, instead of rejecting that uh, defiled food, that defiled, those defiled animals... They offered those animals on God's altar. And then they complained. Oh, what a weariness. Oh, what a weariness. You know, God told them that while they were despising His name, complaining about it, He said, My name shall be great among the Gentiles. My name shall be great among the nations. God was going to do a work, and it's the work that we are involved in today as God has called out a people for His name called the church. Now in chapter 2 this evening, we're going to see that God continues to address these wayward priests. 
who have corrupted the law of Moses. In fact, the way that they corrupted the law of Moses was in showing partiality in how it was administered. And then God will address the people in general and how they were treating their wives in particular, how they had profaned the Lord's holy institution of marriage. So, let's get started. If you're not already there, turn in your Bibles to Malachi chapter 1, starting in verse 1. And now, O priests, this commandment is for you. This is God's commandment for the priests. They were supposed to be the spiritual leaders, but they weren't leading in a correct and godly fashion, according to how God desired them to lead his people. So God gives them a word, a word of tough love. Look at verse 2. If you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you do not take it to heart. Now, this may mean that God would curse the blessing that the priest gave out to the people, but more likely it meant that the blessings of food that the people brought as sacrifice, which the priests, you see, had a share of, would be, in fact, and in fact already was, cursed. Well, I know for sure if they're bringing lame, blind, sick cows and the priests are getting a share in it, that that's already cursed food. God knew they wouldn't take it to heart. He knew they would not here to give glory to his name and so their blessings their provision was already cursed you know this is sort of a picture of religion without relationship isn't it they had all the form but they had none of the heart for god their service to god was just simply empty formalism like we find in so so many churches today they know when to stand, they know when to sit, they know when to sing responsibly, they know when to remain silent, they know when to kneel, but when they leave that place of worship, God is not with them because all they have is dead religion. In verses 3 and 4, Malachi says, Behold, or it's God speaking actually, Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your solemn, solemn feasts. And one will take you away with it. Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. So God even affects their descendants because of their sin. You know, I've had guys tell me that their sin didn't hurt anyone. All the while, their families were suffering because of it. I've had them look at me right in the face. You know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt anybody else. Maybe they were taking drugs or whatever. It doesn't hurt anybody else. And their families are suffering. Our sin not only affects us, but it affects those around us as well. And speaking of how our sin affects us, God says this, he says, I'm going to spread refuse on your faces. And, and that means just what you think it means. The excrement, the poop from the animals that were being offered. And we learned last chapter it was lame, blind, and sick animals. That excrement was supposed to be burned outside the sanctuary, but God was going to rub their noses in it so they could smell their own sin and so everyone else could see it. You know, your Bible's pretty graphic sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to rub your nose in it, is what God is telling him. And God did this, by the way, to purify the priesthood. That my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. 
Now the priests, if you remember, were called from the tribe of Levi only. This is why it's called, by the way, the Levitical priesthood, because it's from Levi. They were all Levites. God warns them. He warns them in strong language in order to correct them. It's tough love. And sometimes we need tough love. Amen? Amen. Sometimes God's just got to speak to us with a two by four before we get it. Now look at verses five and six. My covenant was with him, speaking of Levi, one of life and peace. And I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned many away from iniquity. So God uses the godly descendants of the tribe of Levi as an example to these ungodly descendants, these ungodly priests. Levi, you see, was reverent. He feared me. He was reverent before my name, God says. Levi also knew God's word. It says the law of truth was in his mouth. Levi was also fair and just in administering God's law. It says injustice was not found on his lips. He also had godly character. He walked with me in peace and equity. And he also taught God's law, God's word. It says he turned many away from iniquity. In verse 7 it says, For, for the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. So this is the reason for godly character and activity on the part of the priest. He's the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And, and by the way, by the way, uh, in the New Testament, this is the primary duty of all pastors. They are to know God's word and give it out. They are to know God's word and give it out. That's their primary duty. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge and people should seek the law from his mouth. In the book of Acts chapter 6, there was a complaint about how some widows were not being served properly. So the apostles settled that complaint by appointing the first deacons to take <laughs> charge of the widow's ministry. In making these appointments of others to serve the apostles, uh, or to serve, the apostles said this in verse 2 of Acts chapter 6. They said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So their primary duty was the word of God, you see. My primary duty, above everything else, is to study God's word and to faithfully bring that word to you. Nothing else that I do is as important as that. And if I fail to do that, then nothing else really matters. Now, I do a lot of other stuff, including vacuuming. <laughs> but if I spend all my time vacuuming and don't study God's word, then I've failed to do my primary duty, you see. In verse 8, it says, But... You, speaking of these priests, have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. So these priests had departed from the way. They had left God's word. As a result, many of God's people had stumbled into sin. God's people, you see, no longer knew God's truth because the men who were supposed to know the truth and give it out had corrupted the covenant of Levi. And, and you know, in many, and I, it's unfortunate, but in many churches today, you can hear everything but God's word from the pulpit. God's truth is not kept, but society's truth is. So whatever is the going truth of society, that's what they teach, that's what they preach. And they bend the word of God to make it appear that that's what it says. They are as corrupt as these priests were in Malachi's day. Maybe one day they're going to wake up with refuse on their faces when their false truth caves in. 
In verse 9 it says, Therefore, I also have made you, those priests, contemptible and base before all the people, because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law. So not only were the priests not keeping and teaching God's law, but they were misusing God's law. They were showing partiality in how it was administered. They were, you see, corrupt. And I'm trying not to say anything about other corruption that's going on in our nation today. So I won't. But they were corrupt. They were showing partiality in how they administered God's law. So the priesthood was a mess in Malachi's day. And that led to the people being a mess as well because they weren't teaching God's Word and giving out God's Word. So now look at how God addresses the people. Verses 10 and 11. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another? By profaning the covenant of the fathers. Judah has dealt treacherously and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution which he loves. He has married the daughter of a foreign god. Israel was supposed to be a unique and special people before God. They were set apart. That's, by the way, what the word holy means. They were set apart. They were holy to the Lord. They were not supposed to intermarry with the pagan nations around them because their pagan brides would lead them into idolatry. This is how the Moabite king, Balak, got God to judge Israel. He sent his maidens over to entice Israel's men into marriage so that God would judge them. And he did. We also read in the Old Testament of, of the evil king Ahab who married the Sidonian woman, Jezebel. And she brought the worship of Baal to Israel. And this was happening all over again in Nehemiah and Malachi's days. It says, for Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. How many of you know God loves marriage? Amen? That's his holy institution. That's, he set apart marriage as this. But Israel had married the daughter of a foreign god. So these gals that they were marrying, they were daughters of a foreign god. So God calls marriage the Lord's holy institution which he loves. You know, marriage is not a man-invented idea. How many of you know that? God invented marriage. And so God gets to make the rules on marriage. Amen? Amen. It's God's institution. It says right here, the Lord's holy institution which he loves. If God invented marriage, then God gets to set the rules for marriage. Amen? Amen? So he invented it and he, he loves marriage. He loves the institution of marriage. Marriage is God's plan for men and women. Not men and men. And not women and women. And not people and animals. And good grief, it's a shame we even have to say that, isn't it? Yeah. But unfortunately, we have to say that today. It's God's plan for men and women but only by God's design. And for Israel, for Israel, not for all of us, but for Israel, it was God's design that they remain a separate and distinct people by only marrying among themselves. Now for the church, that's all of us, it's God's design that believers marry believers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, after answering questions the Corinthians had about marriage, Paul says this in verse 39. He says, A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes. And then Paul adds, Only 
in the Lord. Only in the Lord. We also read about being not being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I won't even conduct a marriage ceremony where both parties are not professing believers in Jesus Christ. I won't knowingly violate God's word. And neither should we. None of us should. Amen? If you're living together and you're not married, you're violating God's will. If you are a believer dating an unbeliever, you are asking for trouble. If you came to faith in Christ after being married as an unbeliever, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 verses 12 through 16 that you should remain married in order to honor the marriage and be a witness for Christ to your spouse and family. And God has so, so much to say about the institution of marriage that he loves. But Israel was violating this holy institution. An institution that God made for man's benefit, by the way. In verse 12, it says, May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, being awake and aware, yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. This is a call for the destruction of everyone from the tents of Jacob who does this, that God would cut them off from Israel. Everyone that marries a foreign bride and then thinks it's acceptable. I've divorced my wife, married this foreign chickie, and now I'm going to bring an offering down to the temple to the Lord. Thank God. And the Lord says, that's not right. And, and by the way, the phrase translated being awake and aware is a catch-all that simply means everyone. Every man who does this. We likewise must not think that we can cohabitate, fornicate, divorce without cause, remarry, and then think God accepts our worship. He does not. Nor will he bless you unless you repent. Amen? Now look at verses 13 and 14. And this is the second thing you do. So beyond that, this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. So he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say... For what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. So the wives of these men who had been divorced so that they could marry a younger pagan wife, these wives were coming and they were weeping and crying at the very same altar that their former husbands were piously making their offerings to God on. They thought God didn't see or care. But he says here, the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously. God saw what they were doing. He calls it treachery. They were betraying their marriage vows. The covenant of marriage that they had made. They made a covenant. They made an agreement to be married. And they were betraying that covenant. It was treachery, you see. We also see here, by the way, the number one reason for marriage given in the Bible. And it's not, by the way, procreation. And it's not sex. It's companionship. That's the number one reason for marriage in the Bible is companionship. It says here, yet she is your companion. All the way back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, we read of this companionship. It says there, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. You see? So he made a help for him, a helpmeet for him, right? A companion for him. Because it wasn't good for a man to be alone. 
So marriage, first and foremost, is all about companionship. So if you're married, your spouse ought to be your best friend, the person you want to spend your time with. Amen? That's why God gave you a spouse, right? For companionship. All the other stuff is just a benefit. Now look at verse 15. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. In marriage we read over and over the two become one flesh. And this is, by the way, why God hates divorce. It tears people apart. It tears families apart. It destroys the very fabric of society. And and we're seeing the results of that in our country today. Years and years of divorce have given us tens of millions of broken homes with broken children. And this is no doubt Satan's plan of destruction. God's plan is for one man and one woman to be married until death do them part. This is healthy for families. Families that stay together are healthy families. It says that God seeks, or he seeks godly offspring. You know, children are less likely to, or, or more likely to grow up well-adjusted and godly when they're in their family with their own parents, right? But in divorce, they're more likely to grow up maladjusted. It's as simple as that. God, you see, knows what He's doing. Amen? In verse 16, it says, For the Lord God of Israel says that He hates divorce. He hates it. For it covers one's garment with violence. You know, if you're in in the Old Testament days, if you were going to marry someone, or even in the act of marriage, one of the symbols was that you took your, your outer garment off and you covered your bride-to-be with it, symbolizing that she was going to come in under your care, under your protection, under your love, you see. But it's as if in divorce you rip that garment off. And it says, for it covers one's garment with violence. You violently take away all protection, all covering, all love from your spouse. God hates divorce. Therefore, he says, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. It's a violent tearing away of what God has put together. So don't do it. Amen? Amen. Don't do it. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. In verse 17, he says, You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, In what way have we wearied him? In that you say, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or, where is the God of justice? You know, God's not fooled when we call evil good and good evil. He knows the difference even if we pretend to not know. If God could get tired, these things would wear him out. He uses some human ideas to convey this by saying you've wearied the Lord with your words, but but God doesn't get tired. But I think he's just, that's a way of saying, you know what, I'm I'm tired of hearing that from you. (laughs) You ever said that to somebody? Probably your spouse. (laughs) I'm just tired of hearing that from you. Well, God's tired of hearing this stuff from us as well. So what can we take away from this chapter? First and foremost, God's leaders must know and teach God's truth, God's word above all else. Above all else. And and I sometimes hear what other pastors are doing. 
In fact, I, I sometimes, I was talking to my wife about this the other day, you know, I ran into another fella and it's like, gosh, that guy's doing all this stuff. He's doing this and doing that and he's got this going on and that going on and this going on. I think, gosh, why am I not doing all that stuff? What am I doing? Well, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm studying and teaching God's Word above all else. I'm doing other stuff. But that's my primary duty. That's my primary call. I'm called to be a pastor teacher. And as a result, that's where I need to focus my attention, my energy, uh, my time. And that's what I do. I'm, I'm often out in my little shed studying, burning the oil, literally burning the oil in my kerosene heater until midnight. You know, going through God's Word, studying it, preparing a message. That's my primary duty. So I remember that. I remember that it's my responsibility to feed God's sheep. You know, when Jesus restored Peter to ministry after he denied Christ, we read in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17, that he told Peter three times, and, and I believe he did this for emphasis. He said to Peter, feed my sheep, Tend my sheep and feed my lambs. Same thing. Feed my sheep. Pastors who do not labor to provide God's people with God's word are really neglecting their primary responsibility. And even though, you know what, I'm, I'm gifted by God, so I don't take it. Whenever you guys say, oh, that's a great sermon, Pastor Rob. You know, I, I always try to deflect that and give glory to God because I recognize it as God's gift. But even with God's gift, I don't walk up here and just open my Bible. I spend hours and hours and hours studying before I ever walk up here. So even though God has gifted and called me to teach, I still got to put the work in. Amen? Amen. As every pastor ought to be doing. So now I don't feel so bad when I'm do not doing all the other stuff. Because <laughs> I'm doing this thing I'm supposed to be doing, you see. Now the second thing we can take away from this evening is that God simply hates divorce. And He hates it because He knows what it does to us. He knows what it does to families. He knows what it does to children and even to society. And because of that, He hates it. It hates it. It covers one's garment with violence. So if you're married, stay married. If you're contemplating marriage, make sure he or she is a believer and make sure he or she is the one God has for you. Amen? Because Amen. you're going to get stuck with them. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and pray and we'll have the worship team come back up. Father, we just thank you for your word tonight. Certainly, Lord, there are aspects of, of this chapter and, and, and aspects of Malachi as a whole that are just simply tough love. You love your people, and so you speak the hard things to us at times, things that we need to hear. Sometimes, Lord, it's, it's course correction. We're going the wrong way, and that way is going to lead to destruction. And so, Lord, you, you correct our course. You speak to us these things. And so, God, may we take it to heart. May we learn the lessons you have for us in the book of Malachi. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. 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 Well, thank the Lord that we have a pastor who points us to Christ each and every week.